Hello folks and welcome back to Sky Bat on the Ground with yours truly. We are on to chapter 10 of the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, Aircraft Performance. Last lesson we've been learning about how to load an airplane and make sure it's within proper weight and balance limitations. And now we are going to be learning about how we can predict how well the airplane is going to fly. Because <clears throat> there are cases where even if the airplane is loaded within legal limits, it may not want to fly as well as you would hope it to. Well, how are we going to understand this? Well, to start understanding it, we have to dive back in the pool. So let's take a trip down. Well, I can't even see through this. Let us jump into the pool. And uh, remember, we live in a giant ocean of air. We live at the bottom of this ocean of air. And what happens when you jump into a pool and you go down to the bottom and you start swimming down and you start feeling all that pressure against your ears? Maybe you have to blow against your uh, eardrums there to so equalize the pressure. And that's because you have all the weight of the pool on top of you when you get down to the bottom of the pool. Well, we live at the bottom of our ocean of air, and it's the exact same thing with our atmosphere. You have all the weight of the atmosphere pressing down on top of you, and when you're down at sea level, so let's, uh, let's just draw some sea right here. When you're down at sea level, you have the greatest amount of air pressure on top of you. Here's some uh, nice hotel resorts and uh, maybe a nice mountain over here and some people and stuff. So we live at the bottom. That's our atmosphere. How much pressure is at the very bottom of the atmosphere when we're at sea level? Well, on a standard day, on, in standard conditions, the amount of atmospheric pressure is, is 29.92 inches of mercury. <clears throat> and... Uh, that's just because if you could take a dish of mercury and put a hollow tube uh, with the vacuum in it, the atmospheric pressure would push the mercury up in that tube up 29.92 inches. Okay, so what happens when you go up higher? Well, if you're swimming back up to the top of the pool, you don't have all that pressure against your ears anymore. Same thing with the atmosphere. As you go up higher, you start the atmospheric pressure starts decreasing. And it continues decreasing until while well, you get out of the atmosphere and you're in space. We're not going to fly that high today. But how much does the atmospheric pressure decrease as you increase your altitude? There is something called the standard lapse rate for your atmospheric pressure. And that is about one inch of mercury for each thousand feet of elevation increase. So you're down at sea level 29.92 inches of mercury if you go up to a thousand feet. Now, the atmospheric pressure is going to be about 28.92 inches of mercury. Once you get above 10,000 feet, this rule of thumb doesn't, it kind of falls apart. You have to use uh, some uh, charts with um, com com correction factors. Uh, but below 10,000 feet, the rule of thumb is about an inch of mercury for each thousand feet that you increase your altitude. So that is how the atmospheric pressure changes as you go up higher. What about something else? Have you ever thought about how temperature might change if you go up higher? And I'm sure you have uh, observed this. You're down perhaps in Sacramento Valley and it's a very hot day. You go up to the mountains and oh, it's nice and cool up here, isn't it? And that's why everybody else and their dog is here at Lake Tahoe because it's nice and cold. Um, so how much does the temperature decrease as you go up higher? Well, first of all, what is standard temperature at sea level? They have decided, they have uh, come up with the standard temperature, and that is 15 degrees Celsius at sea level. Just get used to working with Celsius because you're going to do it a lot as a pilot. And as you start going up higher, the standard lapse rate for temperature is, for each 1,000 foot increase of elevation, 2 degrees Celsius. Okay, so if it's a standard day down here at sea level, 15 degrees Celsius, and uh, we go up to Lake Tahoe, that's about 6,000 feet. What's the temperature going to be up there? Well, let's see, 6,000 feet, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, so uh, times that by 2, that would be a 12 degree temperature change. 15 degrees at sea level, that means it would be 3 degrees up here at Lake Tahoe at 6,000 feet. So there you go, standard conditions, that is what our, how our atmospheric pressure varies as you go up um, an inch for each thousand feet and two degrees of temperature change for each thousand feet. 
and these are standard conditions down at sea level. Well, guess what? We don't always have standard conditions. In fact, we almost never, never, we almost never have standard conditions, at least not for very long. <clears throat> so how does this affect aircraft performance? Well, you remember that as we go higher, the air, the air gets less dense. As you go higher, you have less atmospheric pressure squishing the air together, and so it's, the molecules are able to spread apart. That means you're going to have less air actually flowing over the wings of your airplane. Your plane is going to be uh, not going to do as well as you go to higher altitude. It's going to um, <clears throat> it's going to perform worse. Same thing happens when you increase your temperature. If you have a really hot day, those air molecules tend to spread apart as well and you have less dense air, and so you have worse aircraft performance. What about when you're going up higher? <clears throat> it gets colder, but the air pressure is decreasing, so how does that juggle out? While going higher, that has a predominant effect, even though the temperature is getting colder and you'd think that would make the air denser the decreasing air pressure has the predominant effect. But hey, maybe you might have a hot day at high altitudes. It happens at Lake Tahoe, and that can produce problems. Well, how can we predict how the airplane is going to perform? Well, first of all, we need to have a starting point, and that's why we have our standard conditions and the 29.92 inches of mercury, 15 degrees Celsius at sea level. So let us have our airplane down here at sea level and in order to figure things out, we're going to start from standard conditions and then we're going to move on from there. So, uh, I always forget to draw the waves. Okay. Alright, so here's some waves and a nice palm tree to give it a tropical feel. And we'll put some coconuts on the palm tree. I won't draw the monkey because that takes a little bit too much time. Here is our airplane down on the ramp. And okay, we are ready to see how non-standard conditions affect our airplane performance. So these are standard conditions. By the way, you're going to see this abbreviation a lot, and that is ISA. It stands for International Standard Atmosphere, and that's because the International Civil Aviation Organization has adopted this as the world standard for the standard atmosphere. So every time you see ISA, just think 15 degrees Celsius, 29.92 inches. Okay, so the airplane's down at sea level, and we don't have a standard atmosphere day today. It's not 29.92 inches, but the but instead the altimeter setting has been reported at 29.72 inches. So we learned in our flight instruments lesson that we have to uh, correct, we have to put in a little uh, correction into our altimeter so that it reads accurately for today's uh, pressure setting. And so we have that handy dandy Colesman window where we just put in that altimeter setting of 29.72 and then we see the altimeter points at its correct indication of zero feet because that's exactly where we're at. But we want to see how this pressure change is going to affect our aircraft performance. Because remember, as you go higher up, you have less pressure. And if you have less pressure, the air density is going to be less, and the airplane is going to perform worse because you have less air density. Less air density means less engine power that's being produced. That means the propeller is less efficient. It means the wings produce less lift. So we want to find out what our altitude is relative, pressure-wise, relative to that standard datum point of 20, standard datum plane of 29.92 inches. So how do we figure that out? Well, there's a really easy way, and that is to just plug in 29.92 inches into your altimeter setting. So that's what we'll do. We'll use our handy-dandy knob right there and put that in the Colesman window. And guess what? Our altimeter points at about 200 feet. And that's because two-tenths of an inch, uh, an inch is a thousand feet different, so 200 feet difference. You can just, you know, we can do uh, as mental math. Um, if you want to have a, a precise number, you have, have to do it with a real altimeter, or you have to use a conversion factor because, uh, and they'll be on some chart like this, because it doesn't work out exactly um, if you use the rule of thumb of uh, a thousand feet for each inch of mercury change. 
but this gives us a ballpark figure. And so now we see that, okay, yeah, the air is less dense today, today so the pressure is, that means the airplane feels as if it's at a little bit of a higher altitude pressure-wise. Now, what is another factor that causes the air density to be uh, less? That's right, we talked about it, and that is temperature. If you have a hot day, the air molecules tend to start spreading apart because they're zinging around more, and so the air uh, is less dense on a hot day. And we are at the beach, and I don't really think it's 15 degrees Celsius today. I think it's more like 35 degrees Celsius. And so that means we are going to have pretty, uh, the air is going to be much less dense than it could be. And the airplane is actually going to feel as if it's at a much higher altitude. And so we call this, actually, density altitude. Density altitude is pressure altitude corrected for non-standard temperature. <clears throat> So how do we figure out what our density altitude is? Well, there's a simple rule of thumb. Rule of thumbs are pretty cool. Uh, they give you approximations. So you have to take uh, your temperature that you actually have at your site, in this case 35 degrees Celsius, and then figure out the difference between that temperature and standard temperature for that altitude. So 15, 35 minus 15 degrees, there's a 20 degree difference. You multiply that by 120, that gives us 2,400 feet. Then you add the uh, pressure altitude of 200 feet, and you get a total of 20... Ooh, let's see if you guys can see that so it doesn't run off there. <clears throat> so you get a total of 2,600 feet. That is what your airplane is going to feel as if it's performing at. You're down here at sea level, but hey, if you normally get a climb rate of 700 feet per minute at sea level on a standard conditions day, and say you go up to 3,000 feet and you get maybe um, 300 feet per minute uh, climb rate, that's what you're gonna be getting right now because you're closer to 3,000 feet. Your airplane thinks it's way up here, somewhere in the foothills, um, of the Sierra Nevadas on top of a mountain at 2,600 feet. This is your density altitude. <clears throat> so you can see how pressure and temperature, these non, when it's non-standard, is going to uh, have the, the airplane is going to feel as if it's at a very different place than it really is. So it's going to perform as if it's at a higher altitude. So watch out for high density altitudes. There's also one other factor that we need to mention that affects air density, and that is humidity. We learned about this in aerodynamics class. If you have high humidity, the air is going to be less dense once again, lighter, and so you're going to have decreased aircraft performance. We don't have any rule of thumb or uh, computation that we can do to figure out exactly how it's going to affect it, but just realize that, hey, the uh, humidity will affect the aircraft performance adversely. Okay, so um, one other side point. Interesting thing, if you have a high density altitude, even though your airplane is not going to be performing at its best, it's actually going to fly through the air faster than what your airspeed indicator shows you. And that's because the air is less dense. The, air is a the airplane is able to move through it faster. There's less drag hindering it. So true airspeed increases with density altitude. <clears throat> All right, so now um, the way that we uh, put this into practical use is by referencing our aircraft performance charts. So once we've calculated density altitude, we can go to the performance charts and figure out, okay, how much is it going to, how, uh, how much runway am I going to use up as I'm trying to take off at these conditions? How much is how many uh, feet per minute can I expect on my climb rate? How high am I going to be able to climb? All that kind of stuff. And so the pilot's operating handbook or aircraft flight manual is going to provide you all that type of information, that performance data about takeoff distances, landing distances, climb rate, range, endurance, uh, descent, stuff like that. Um, even though the POH is going to have a standardized order that you get your information in. When you get to the performance part, it's going to 
obviously they have different ways of presenting that information so depending on the airplane you're just going to have to figure you're just gonna to have to learn their charts or their graphs or tables or whatever so just be aware of that okay so um, as we look at aircraft performance one of the important things that we will be interested in is how well our airplane is going to climb at these conditions because we need to know that for planning are we going to be able to clear clear those hills that are a couple miles away from the runway are we going to even be able to clear those trees at the end of the runway so how does climbing um, how can we predict climbing and one of the ways that we have to keep track of what's going on is how much excess horsepower we have with our airplane as you're flying in straight and level flight um, and uh, the airplane is using, let's say the airplane has 160 horsepower total uh, in its engine and say it's using about 130 horsepower in order to maintain level flight so that's just using it to keep it flying forward and get the air moving over the wings and that has to overcome the drag okay so that means we have 30 horsepower extra to play with if we just keep the airplane flying level, we could use the go full throttle, and that 30 extra horsepower would help the airplane fly faster, <clears throat> and you would eventually get to the point where, while you're using all that, you can't go any faster than that. You can also use that to climb the airplane. So, instead of, uh, yeah, you just keep your same airspeed, and then you just go full throttle, and then you pick up the nose, and you'll keep your airspeed maintained, and you'll be able to climb, because you have this excess horsepower that you're putting to use. Now uh, there's also another way that you can climb your airplane and that is to trade your airspeed that you have for altitude. You can trade but remember you lose one as you gain the other so you're flying at 100 knots and you want to pick up the nose without you don't ch uh, touch the throttle so you pick up the nose and the airplane starts slowing down at 80, 70, 60 knots. It's climbing higher and higher until finally all you're running out of airspeed and then it'll start uh, coming back down again unless you throttle up or something. So you can, if you use excess hor extra horsepower or if you use your airspeed, those are ways that you can climb. You just need to make sure that you realize when you are running out of both because that is a bad situation to find yourself in. <clears throat> altitude uh, is altitude and horsepower, these are your reserves. And uh, as you're getting up to a certain, as you go higher, remember the airplane is going to um, perform worse uh, because the air gets less dense. You're going to finally find yourself at a point where you're at full throttle and that is just enough to keep you in the air without starting to descend. And we call that the absolute ceiling. A little bit before that point is called the service ceiling where you're only able to climb at a rate of 100 feet per minute. So this is, uh, um, this is where the airplane is, yeah, it's not really going to climb much higher than that. And that's because you don't have any more reserve horsepower. You're using all your throttle uh, to just maintain level flight. Now this gets important because your, say your airplane has an absolute ceiling of 10,000 feet. And say you're up at Lake Tahoe on a very hot day and it is Elevation, the elevation of Lake Tahoe is 6,000 feet and it's a very hot day today and guess what we did our calculations and we found out that the density altitude is 10,000 feet hmm we just loaded our plane up and we are ready to roll down the runway so that we can go back home to Sacramento area can we expect our airplane to even climb at all if our, if our absolute ceiling is 10,000 feet I don't think so. Our airplane is not going to go very far and this is how a lot of pilots have found themselves in trouble where they have realized that they have run out of airspeed or power or both and they've run out of options and so it's very important to be aware of what the density altitude is what your airplane is really going to be performing like. Okay so uh, altitude um, and air and uh, air density, temperature, these all affect uh, our climb um, 
our ability to climb and uh, weight also affects your ability to climb. If you have a heavier airplane, it's going to climb at a slower rate and there's going to be a point where, hey, if we load the airplane up too much, <laughs> it's not going to climb at all. So you need to realize that when you load the airplane more, you're going to have less reserve thrust. Now, thrust is also related to another performance consideration and that is fuel flow. If you're driving your car and you floor the gas pedal, you're going to be burning more gas, obviously. And same thing in the airplane. If you go full throttle, you're going to be burning more fuel. And if you look at a, uh, a little comparison right here, a little uh, plot of this, uh, the faster we go, the more power we have to use in order to um, sustain that speed. And so you go faster, 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 you have to use more and more throttle and you get to a point where uh, you have maximum throttle and you can't go any faster than that. Well, if you wanted to save, the, if you wanted to have the most endurance that you could get for the amount of fuel that you had, what you'd have to do is figure out the airspeed that you could fly at which you could maintain level of flight using the least amount of power. So you just find that point and okay, it's right down here. And you've seen this before when we were looking in the aerodynamics class and that is the maximum lift over drag ratio where you're producing the most lift for the least drag penalty. And this is where you get maximum endurance because you are burning, you're getting, um, you you uh, have the least fuel flow for that particular uh, for to maintain the airplane in level flight. Now, you're going to be able to stay in the air a long time, but you're not necessarily going to be able to go the furthest. It just means that you are going to be able to fly for a really long time. You're just going to be going really slow. We need to figure out uh, if we want to have maximum range, then we actually have to increase our speed just a little bit so that we can find a place where we have the best ratio between speed and fuel flow. Um, and so our aircraft uh, pilot's operating handbook will tell us that information in the performance uh, section. So uh, somewhere over here is where you get uh, max maximum range. Now we were going back this way I said there's a point at which you use the least, the minimum power for uh, to uh, be able to maintain your altitude. What happens when you pull back? Uh, well, what happens if you try to fly slower than that airspeed and you still want to maintain your altitude? Well, remember when we looked at the drag curve, it was basically the same thing. You start getting more and more drag, and so in order to maintain your altitude, you have to start pushing in that throttle, and so you're using more and more power and this is where it gets really weird because in order to fly slower you have to use more power and this is what we call the region of reversed command because it is backwards when you are on the right side of the maximum endurance uh, point if you want to fly faster, you just pull forward the throttle. Uh, you just push forward the throttle. When you're on this side in the region of reversed command, if you want to fly slower, you have to push forward the throttle. And once again, this is where pilots can find themselves into trouble. You don't want to be flying on the, we call this the back side of the power curve, when you're at low altitudes because, well, hey, you are, say you're trying to take off at Lake Tahoe again or something and we saw this example in a previous lesson where you go full throttle and you try to lift the airplane off, force the airplane off the ground before it has achieved flying speed and what happens you don't have any excess power in order to sustain a climb and so something has to give the airplane is just going to settle back down. The only way to get onto the front side of the power curve is to actually increase your airspeed and if you don't have any excess power to do that the only way to increase your airspeed is to push forward not really something you can do when you're five feet above the ground and it, it doesn't leave you very many options 
So you always need to have some type of reserve. You need to make sure you have enough airspeed or you have enough air, uh, extra horsepower that you can uh, put in with your throttle. So these are very important things to keep in mind. We've learned about, uh, we, yeah, we've learned a lot today about how we can figure out how uh, non-standard conditions affect the airplane and about this important region of reverse command. And next lesson we're going to get practical and see if our airplane is going to be able to take off in a certain amount of distance. Say we have uh, 3,000 feet of runway to use and we need to find out is our airplane going to be able to take off in 3,000 feet or not. So join me next time for more Skybound on the Ground.